Last week was a busy one for Indian diplomacy. Three countries, multiple bilaterals, engagements, diaspora events, and even some dance and music. What stood out was this statement. We are victims of global power play. We want you to be an advocate for us, especially the smaller ones amongst us are had in its right context and given support by you, the leader of the Global South. And we would rally behind your leadership at Global Forum. That was Papua New Guinea's Prime Minister James Marape. He was addressing the Forum for India-Pacific Islands Cooperation. That's where he called India the leader of the Global South. But what is this Global South that he's talking about? Is India truly leading its charge and why should you care? Hello and welcome. I'm Palki Sharma and on this show we'll try to read between the lines, the stated and the unstated, the obvious and the hidden, to bring you the full story. It's a diplomacy blitzkrieg for India. Just this week, Prime Minister Narendra Modi travelled to three nations, first to Japan for the G7 summit. <laughs> then to Papua New Guinea for India's Pacific push. <laughs> and finally to Australia for bilaterals and engagements. I said to my friend, the Prime Minister, before the last time I saw someone on the stage here was Bruce Springsteen, and he didn't get the welcome that Prime Minister Modi has got. <laughs> Prime Minister Modi is the boss. But it doesn't end there. Next month, he's going to the US for a state visit. And then in September, it is time for the G20 summit. India holds the G20 presidency this year, which means world leaders will be here in New Delhi debating some of the most crucial issues of the world. Before that, India will also be hosting the SCO summit, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. India is the rotating president of this group too. It's a big deal for Indian diplomacy. But it hasn't always been this rosy. The world is more divided than ever before. Since the Ukraine war, it has split into two, the East and the West. The war forced everyone to choose sides, but not India. New Delhi chose the more difficult path, the middle path. It maintained its age-old relations with Russia while strengthening its ties with the West. It may sound like the best of both the worlds, but it wasn't easy. The West chided us. They slammed us. There were calls to boycott. But India held on. We did what we believed was best for us, not what the West thought was the best. And with the G20 summit this year, this middle path approach gains more relevance, especially to address issues of the global south, which brings us to the question, what is the global south? It's a term that emerged after the Cold War, often used to define countries in Asia, Africa and Latin America. Nations that are low income, have a huge population, poor infrastructure and rampant marginalization. Basically, the global north is the rich, prosperous side, a.k.a. the West themselves, and the global south are usually developing nations, former colonies of the same West. This is a region that has long been ignored, a region whose priorities were overlooked by the West, but not anymore. Today's global south is very different. It's not a monolith anymore. Its economies are changing, access to technology is expanding, and it is emerging as a global powerhouse, which puts India in a unique position. India is the fifth largest economy in the world, arguably one of the fastest growing ones right now. We have a GDP of over $3 trillion. India addressed the pandemic better than most nations. It administered 2 billion vaccines to its citizens. Not just that, it provided vaccines to the rest of the world too. When Nepal and Turkey faced natural disasters, India was there first, offering help faster than others. We did not just promise, we walked the talk. India was also at the forefront of evacuations, bringing not just our citizens back home, but also those of neighbouring nations. 
This makes India a suitable leader for the global south. But this is not the first time we've tried to lead. Let's rewind to the Cold War. Like right now, the world was divided into two blocks, the East and the West. And countries were supposed to align with either. But India did not agree. So it devised the non-aligned movement. This was for the developing nations of the world, those who did not want to align with either the East or the West. But India's drive to lead the global South then was not successful. What India lacked then was political will and economic prowess. That has changed now, which makes the G20 a crucial forum for India, a place to cement itself as the leader of the global South. In January this year, New Delhi hosted a virtual summit. It was called the Voice of Global South Summit. More than 125 developing nations were invited. The idea was quite simple. The world must listen to the priorities of the Global South, and that is exactly what New Delhi plans to raise at the G20. The first one is debt relief for developing nations. During the Cold War, the Global South was vulnerable. It needed money. The West was wary of growing communist influence, so it handed out development aid to several nations. That was the 1990s. Those gains have since withered away. So New Delhi is pushing for global debt relief. Reports say India is drafting a proposal, a proposal to help nations hit by both the pandemic and the war. Basically, it wants lending nations, including China, to take a haircut on loans. The second one is intellectual property rights protection. India has its task cut out here. The pandemic taught us how crucial healthcare is. Gatekeeping that formula is not helping the world. Last June, nations agreed on one part of this, a temporary patent waiver for vaccines. But India and 80 other countries have a new pitch now, a global patent waiver for COVID-19 diagnostics. Another concern is access to affordable medicine, a cause that India must champion. And three, climate financing. We all know that climate change is upon us. Heat waves are getting worse, floods are more common, and cyclones are more intense. Freak weather is becoming the new normal and the global south is bearing the brunt of this. South Asia is especially vulnerable to climate change. This includes the likes of India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. They may not be responsible for the climate change, but they will be the worst to suffer and the first to suffer. So India must push for climate financing. Developed economies must contribute more beyond the $100 billion agreed at the COP27 last November. The existing climate agreements are not enough. They're not meeting the needs of the global south. India must use the G20 to push for more. Which brings us to our G20 message. Vasudev Kutumbukam, one family, one earth, one future. But for long, the G20 has not catered to one world. It has catered to a Western world. India aims to change that. It is looking at inclusive leadership. The global south has long been ignored. Its issues have long been sidelined, but not anymore. For the G20, this is a watershed moment with India at its helm. It can finally champion the causes of the global south.